Welcome to episode 123. One, two, three. A that's lot a, of off topic. That's a good number. It is a good number. I like it. Wasn't there a Mercedes model? W123 is not a model. It's like a chassis designation. Yeah, I don't know much about those early Mercedes. It's a shame because they seem kind of cool. They're good cars. They're not like performance cars. They're like cool no, cruisers. They're good cruisers. I mean, most of my cars are not performance cars anyway, so <laughs> that's fine. So what's going on? Uh, not too much. I actually, in the past week since last recording, have done nothing. Nothing. Yeah, nothing car related. I mean, I've done things, just nothing nothing of note worth talking about. Yeah, we attempted to get to the Conquest, but not quite. Uh, that's the plan for I ordered a bunch coming. of parts. You do have all the parts coming. Okay, so I ordered a bunch of parts for the Conquest, the 88. I, we changed out the tire that was dry rotted so we could roll it around. I think we did figure out where the leak was. We figured out where the brake line leak was. Is yep. that uh, one of the lines that goes into a junction block, which is weird that it would be rotted because there's no rust in the rest eh, of the it car. It happens sometimes. But whatever. Um, the car was moved. We actually pushed it with the Raider. Um, broke a taillight. We did break a taillight, but the taillight was full of water anyway, so it wasn't any good anyway, so not a big deal. Yeah, you can't push real hard on the taillight because it will break, but not a big deal. It's a Conquest taillight. It's not a Starion taillight. Those are rare. Mm-hmm. Conquest taillights are common and like $20. Why? Because they sold way more Conquest than Starions. Huh. Well, you got to think Mitsubishi didn't sell cars in this country until 1983, 1984, really, when they started getting dealers opened up. So during the run of the Conquest Starion, there weren't a lot of Mitsubishi dealers yet. Hmm. There were tons of Chrysler Dodge dealers, so they sold a lot more Chrysler. Especially in this area in particular, the Conquest is Sad. much more common than a Starion. I've seen way more Conquest in my life. 100%. Especially in this area, because you know, they started more car sales in the West Coast than here. Yeah. There was a dealership here in 84, but it was not... In fact, my 84 Starion came from that dealership in Lynn. Yeah. But anyway... Already off topic. First sentence of the day. That's what we do. Yeah. Uh, so I got some soft shackles for off-roading from uh, at Spliceworks on Instagram. Mm-hmm. So he's a fellow Montero owner. He is. Uh, so he hand makes these uh, from Samson Rope Amsteel Blue. I don't know what that means. It's the type of rope that they're made from. Okay. And they're super strong and light. So the over like featherweight. Yeah, so the overlanding community, the general consensus, some people still have some D-rings in their recovery stuff, but people are moving away from them because they are dangerous. Mm-hmm. If the if they fail, then it's a projectile, and it'll either hit someone or break equipment. Mm-hmm. So people have come up with these. These ropes are like crazy strong, like yeah, what's tens the, of thousands of yeah, pounds. Yeah, that was like 50,000 pounds something, or something stupid. I, it's something really high yeah. because, because it can be yanked on with a kinetic strap. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing too. So it's soft, so it's easier to go around mounting points. And like, you can also like if uh, if you had a truck that was stuck in the mud, and I want to throw you the rope, and if I threw you a, a D de- ring yeah. and you missed it, it would drop into the mud and sink. Yep, and then you're fishing through the mud, which is not fun. Yeah, and then this rope will float. So it's kind of cool. But, uh, yeah, so definitely check out at Spliceworks on Instagram, mm-hmm. and you just DM him, and he'll uh, take PayPal and send you some awesome yep. stuff. This is not a sponsored post. We just like his stuff. I do like his stuff. Yeah. I we I appreciate small businesses who make quality products. Mm-hmm. Especially for obscure things that we like, like Monteros. Oh, these are universal. These are universal. Obviously, obviously universal, but he's a Montero owner making something cool. Yeah. He does make recovery ropes, too, but mm-hmm. I already had one that we won at the... Northeast Flatlanders. Wasn't one of his? No, that is oh, okay. not. That's a different company. He was raffling off. He gave sh- soft. He gave soft shackles to be raffled off. Oh, okay. But no, th- these uh, these will accompany that recovery strap that we got because it has no way really to attach to a right. vehicle. Because again, with a kinetic strap, it's basically a giant rubber band, so you don't want metal hooks on the end of it. Correct. They are different from a tow strap. So this will all be good when we go off-roading and we need the Xterra to tow out one of our Monteros. <laughs> They're even good Sorry. with... Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I should get a newer uh, tow strap, which is non-kinetic. Mm-hmm. They don't have metal ends on them anymore either. And they're just good. They're even good for 
if we need to move one of our broken cars. I was say, they're really good for moving my ship boxes around. Yeah, well, they're <laughs> like sometimes the tow hooks on these cars are small or they're in tight places and or the metal or they're rusted and we can't use them. We got all kind of something else. Yeah, and the metal the metal hook can damage them. So, um, yeah, these are pretty cool. I posted a picture of them to our Instagram. Mm-hmm. All yeah, right, the idea of looking up, I wind up picking up a set myself. Just yeah. in my own truck. Yeah. All right, so tonight, we'll kick it off with this quote. I wanted to develop a car rally that would be a true adventure. I've always wanted to go beyond my limits and to take other people beyond theirs. Thierry Sabine. So, guess what we're talking about tonight? Are you asking me? Because I already know. You already know. Because we obviously researched it together. We did. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about the Dakar rally. And yeah, because... D- d- Dakar. Paris, Paris to Dakar. Yeah. Well, commonly known now as the Dakar rally. Correct. So Dakar 2019 just ended last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so quick recap. So Nasser Alatia won in the cars. Which kind of car was that? He won in the Toyota. Okay, the pickup truck. Yeah. Okay. They, it's a cars class. Yeah. Even though it's a truck. Yeah, but it's not like a... In relation to the truck class, which is like big Truck six wheel. Like, <laughs> trucks are big. Yeah, 20,000 pound trucks. Yeah. Uh, Toby Bryce won on the bikes. Ricky Brabeck, who's an American, was on the Honda, was You're leading Honda, yeah. with three days to go, which was pretty crazy. Like, he was having a great rally, mm-hmm. and the engine let go on the Honda. So he's out. He didn't win. Um, I don't have like the quads or the, the trucks. I'm sure it was like some Russian truck one. I could probably look it up real quick, but... I don't honestly. I don't. I'm not that into the quads that run. It's just no. Uh, I don't really get into the quads or the side by side that kind of thing. No. Uh, yeah. Robbie Gordon was running running this crazy side by side thing now, and uh, I just I have like a animosity the one. to side by sides because I don't like the fact that they're being run in rallies now. The fact that you can go out and buy one of these things and like spank a bunch of older rally cars. Because yeah, you bought this like purpose built buggy, it's just kind of I don't know, it's whatever. It's not. I'm not into it. I, I don't think it's in the spirit of rally. I but understand the same, they need at the same time entries, brings in fees, entries and competitors. Yeah, but it's it's and they class differently. Yeah, anyway, the, the truck that was here, old man. the truck that won this year was a Kamaz. Yeah, and it looks like it was driven possibly by a Russian team based on their names. Yeah, Edward Nikolov, Yevgeny Yakolev, Vladimir Rybakov. I so I forget. What, I think Toby Price was riding a KTM. KTM 450. Yep. KTM has been dominating the last couple of years in the bikes. KTM has been dominating for a long time. Yeah. KTM is a, all they do is off-road machines. Mm-hmm. So they're pretty good at it. Yeah. Do you know what kind of rally Dakar is? This is something I learned doing this research. It's a, a, ra- a, a rally raid? raid. A rally raid. Yeah, it's yeah. not they, they, they it's cross country. a specific name for it, but yeah, it's cross country over a span of days with like no common points. It's, it's, it's point to point. There's no circling back no so and uh i don't yeah dakar did not invent this style of rally it was just no no there's other ones out there there's just one of the more more common ones um a rally raid has to be at least three days to be considered a raid yeah so that's interesting i'd ever i'd heard the term rally raid mostly from video games yeah because i forget what game it was a toka racing driver or something had the rally raid trucks probably and i was like what is rally raid and then i never really looked into it but i did today and this is what it is so but if you're not familiar with how dakar started it probably seems like a strange name but it is for uh dakar which is the capital of senegal in Mm -hmm. africa so the original race started in paris and ended in dakar yep and now it's just become named dakar and we'll get to it because it it is now only in South America, but they just call it the Dakar. So, and the other interesting thing too, I realized doing this research, I had heard of a Touareg, but I didn't realize what it was. It's a Volkswagen SUV. Yes, but it's named after a nomadic people. But the Volkswagen named it that because they wanted to win Dakar with their Touaregs in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. It was a big rivalry between them and Mitsubishi. But we'll get there. So, you know, winning the rally today requires a massive team and financial backing, along with considerable skill. Uh, finishing it, however, is still within the reach of a determined adventurer. So you can still be an amateur and mm-hmm. enter this. You probably won't win, but you can. No, but the, just finishing is a win. Yeah, it, I mean it's it's ten thousand kilometers or something. 
Oh, let's put it this year. The last year the rally event was held, yeah. it went from France through Europe. It went to Libya, Chad, Niger, Mali, and Senegal. Like, that's a good chunk of the northern half of the Russian, of the Russian, excuse me, the African continent. Yeah. The Russia on the brain from the rally drivers. Um, it's just thinking of the span of that, the size of that is huge. Mm-hmm. Like, huge. Yeah. It is likened to climbing Mount Everest as far as motorsports. Like, it's the motorsports version of, of climbing, climbing Mount Everest. Of climbing Mount Everest. Okay. You know, people, you know, why do people climb Mount Everest? To say they did. Because it's there. Yeah. And why do people do this? Because they can. Because they can. Yeah. Or, or try to. Um, so, that's the crazy thing. So, how it started is... Like, for example, Brad, you're lost in the largest desert in the world. Okay. No way to communicate. Okay. No water. No food. Just a map. Mm-hmm. What's going on in your head? I'm going to die. Yeah. And then, assuming you survive. I would not survive. Are you going to start the hardest competition for human and machine ever? Mm, probably never going back to the desert. Yeah. <laughs> so what I would do. This guy, he was a French motorcycle racer named Thierry Sabine. I think, I think, it, I think he just pronounced it Terry. I thought it was Terry. Yeah, I, I think it's the French spelling of Terry, pretty much. And when I was watching a couple of different documentaries about it, everybody was referring to him as Terry. So, either way, that's I semantics. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I almost now you've it. thrown me. I'll call him Sabine. All right, so it's perfect. If you're not formal with someone, you should call them by their last name anyways when you're reporting on them. So, Sabine was lost in the Libyan desert during the Abidjan Nice motorcycle rally. Okay. Uh, he lost his compass, had no water, no food. Uh, eventually, a few days later, he was rescued via helicopter because they were he was missing. He never yeah, showed up. Like so they went, they, yeah. went, yeah, they went looking for him. Uh, so he claims, you know, after he was rescued, that he had a connection with the desert in this moment, being lost. A beauty in the solitude. This is so very French. Yeah. But also a <laughs> sense of adventure. And, uh, you know... So after his rescue, he decided that it was his life's mission to share this feeling of adventure with as many people as possible. Okay. So he imagined an epic journey starting in Europe and finishing in Dakar, the cap- which is the capital of Senegal, on the African continent. So, Yeah, it's like the the westernmost tip of Africa, I think, too, isn't Senegal? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and this is something that's important to think about when we we're talking about Dakar is that it's kind of a motorsports event that's tied up with like 300 years of colonialism. Yeah. There's, there's hints of it. There's a, there's a lot of it. They, they talk about it a few different times and a few different things that I was watching and reading Yeah, about the fact that a lot of these towns they'll go through hadn't seen a new vehicle yeah. since the French governing parties left, you know, 20 years prior Yeah, and just kind of left these countries to just, yeah. Fend for themselves. Because it was really, I mean, some countries were still under the control through the 90s, but it was very much the Hands 70s, yeah. 80s, 90s. <laughs> colonialism was definitely in its decline yeah, it was, of Europe. It was, it was a hands-off version of colonialism. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty quickly within a year. You know, he was lost in the desert in 1977. Uh, the first Dakar was on December 26, 1978. Yeah. He planned it pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And it started in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. 170 adventure-seeking competitors are entered. And uh, Cyril Nouveau? I forget how to say that. I I don't know. I think it's Cyril Nouveau. Yeah. Pronunciations. French. uh, Won the first event on a motorcycle. And there was no separate class. I for say it was interesting at first. It was just like, run with your brung. Yeah. First There's one across the finish line wins. No separate class for bikes, cars, even trucks. No support, really. People just brought, you know, they rode to checkpoints. They camped. That's the other thing. So there's no GPS in 1978. This is all done. You navigated. You had checkpoints. You had maps. You had a compass. You had a sextant. Um... And you were just set free. So this is very much, we had that episode we talked to Mercedes. Mm-hmm. And. Um, About that trip in the Tacoma. Yeah. The, the uh, Rebel Rally. Yeah. And that was very much 
uh, a throwback to the way they had to navigate in the 70s. Well, if you, again, with the car, because of the tr- tradition involved with it, even once GPS was becoming a thing, yeah, they didn't allow it to be used until more recently. It wasn't until 1992. But even in 92, it was they had a navigation that was allowed to be used, but then they banned it again a few years later. Oh. Um, I think it was in two ninety five or ninety six when a former winner took over as organizer. He changed a bunch of things, and one of them was to go back to paper maps and no navigation. It's not like GPS was very good back then. No, it was it was basically latitude, longitude. And that was yeah. it. I have an early GPS unit that just does. I don't think it works anymore. I haven't looked at it in a long time. I don't know what kind of signal it, it got. It should. It just. It should it's, work off the satellites. I don't remember. But anyway. And it, uh, Interesting thing. It tells it you where you are based on latitude and longitude, but that's it. GPS really took off in the 90s because that's when it was demilitarized okay. by President Clinton. And early versions of it, it was only accurate within like 30 feet. Okay. Because they didn't want it being used for nefarious purposes mm-hmm. to target things. Uh, and then much later on, it was it's now like accurate to feet. Yeah. And now it's on everybody's cell phone, which I think is it was crazy. More, I think it was even more than thirty feet at first. I don't think I think that was a bigger number than that. Yeah, it's irrelevant to the story, but it's a little side note. It is. Well, do you know what the first car to offer any kind of navigation unit, and it was? I think I do, but I'll let you tell me. Well, no, it predates actual navigation and satellite navigation. It was Honda Accord in like 1982. It was like tape. It was literally like a roll-to-roll, like, player piano thing. So it's sort of like what they run on these bikes. Yeah. Where so the root book rolls over. Yes. And you put your map for your region in your dashboard, and you set the course to where you were going, and it gave you an approximation of... Where you are. Where you are. But obviously it wasn't an exact GPS. Weird. And you still had to follow it. Hmm. I think it was like 82 or 81 or somewhere along there. Yeah. I'd have to look it up. I could Early be wrong year, but it was... Interesting. Anyway. So the next event in 1980, they had 216 people enter. So the event is, uh, Dakar Rally is growing. Still leaving from Paris to Dakar. 81 was kind of a watershed moment. So they had, uh, the rally had really taken hold and people have learned about it. Uh, and then by 1982, they'd have over 382 competitors, which is pretty crazy. It's called the Electro Gyro Kator. Hmm. Honda made it was 82 yeah anyway sorry and then in 1983 this was the first time the rally crossed the uh, Tanair Desert uh, which is basically just an ocean of sand it's a Mm -hmm. massive massive place Uh, yeah which is one of the problems of navigating the desert it's just a massive ocean of sand there's no waypoints there's no it's just dunes ever changing dunes yeah there's nothing permanent that you can use for a reference point other than like the sun and the moon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it. And, of course, there was a giant sandstorm, and 40 competitors got lost. Yeah, all at the same time. Yeah. Not like they were lost forever. They were just lost in the sand dunes. Yeah. And eventually they were rescued, uh, but it was nearly, it could have been a massive disaster uh, if they didn't find them. And that's where I found this other quote uh, from probably Michelle Merrill and... Uh, the pist is like the ocean it is wrong not to fear it. As for me, the pist makes me scared. You don't mess around with it. You can't be an artist. So basically, it's like the ocean. you got to respect it. Yeah. Now, what year was that that, that happened? 1983. 83. Well, that was one of the things that helped bring Dakar to the forefront of like yeah. media. But the one that we missed the year before was the biggest thing that really brought what Dakar was to the mainstream. It was when... Um, Mark Thatcher, the Prime Minister of England's son, yeah, entered the rally and wound up missing for like four days. Yeah, so it made obviously natural, na- natural, national news or international news. Yeah, that this guy who was an important figurehead, he, he was the navigator. Yeah, he was a navigator. He's an important figurehead in, in in England, and he went out and was missing. Yeah, I think. Th- the, the story, they were navigating, they somehow missed a waypoint or something, ended up hundreds of miles off course. Yeah. And then the cars broke. Eventually, they somehow... They were in Peugeot station wagons. Yeah. And the rear axle broke. But they were at least traveling in a caravan. So they were three cars in a caravan. Yeah. Their car broke. 
the other two cars went ahead but had mislabeled where they had broken down and they went back to retrieve them and they could not find them. Huh. So they actually had wound up calling off the search because they said that they have no idea where they are, they can't find them, they don't know what happened. And um, Margaret Thatcher paid privateers and went and found them on their own afterwards. And once they found it, it was like, oh, okay. Well, this event will continue to run on because we didn't lose an important person this year. But yeah, at crazy. the same time, it became kind of an international story. And people now who would have had no idea what Dakar was yeah. have now, Dakar is now on the roadmap. Like, hey, this big thing happened. This thing happens every year. It's only been happening for three years, but it's pretty cool stuff. Let's look into this a little bit more. And it got a lot more popular, which is how there were so many competitors in 83 that 40 of them get lost at the same time. Yeah. Mostly, I think it was mostly motorcycles, but that's the other crazy thing, to just do this on a motorcycle. Just... By yourself. Yeah. Yeah, with minimal supplies. Mm-hmm. Absolutely insane. Um, so then, you know, the event is growing. Sabine is a very hands-on organizer. He's always there. He yes. has hands in everything. Uh, and, of course, because the, like, the size of this rally is so huge, you need a helicopter to get around. Right. Uh, helicopters and motorsports, never a good combination. Yeah. Like, just... A lot of times they're flown by people who have money but don't necessarily have a lot of helicopter experience. <laughs> yeah, people are really into helicopters as hobbies. Yeah. I prefer and... my hobbies to keep you on the ground. Yeah, I mean that's that's how we lost Colin McRae. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of NASCAR Bunch drivers. Of NASCAR drivers, Davy Allison. Yeah. Uh, Alan Kulwicki. Yeah. Uh, others. Basically, the moral story: don't get in a helicopter. Yeah, it's not a good hobby. No. <laughs> because uh, Sabine, a French singer named Daniel Beveline, Nathalie Odent, and the helicopter pilot. Francois Xavier Bagnard and the radio technician Jean-Paul Lee Fur all perished in a helicopter crash while they were trying to monitor the race. Yeah, they got caught in like a sandstorm. Yeah, it was like and, some sort of downdraft. Yeah. The witness, there was a one motorcycle rider who witnessed it said that the plane like just, or the helicopter, helicopter just kind of plunged into a sand dune. It was some sort of downdraft. They actually or weren't something. sure even if the pilot was flying or if Sabine himself was flying because yeah. he was known to fly the helicopter. Too, yeah. But nobody knows who was flying at the time. And the I guess the pilot was sort of young, maybe not as experienced. Yeah, it's he was very green. Just an unfortunate accident. And, you know, it was like, surprisingly, though, they still finished the rally. They did. Well, they did it as a tribute to, tribute him. to him. Like, hey, we're not going to stop his event because he passed away. We're going to finish Because he didn't want anybody it. to ever give up. Yeah. And then his father actually took over after that. Yep. And kept the event going. Uh, and it's, you know, so then in 88, the 10th anniversary year yes. was a pretty pivotal year for the event. It's 600 competitors, <laughs> which is like four times the initial. Now you had, after the cancellation of group B, Peugeot was like, well, we have these group B cars. Right. What are we going to do with them? Let's, uh, go race the car with them. Yeah, they changed a lot of the car too. They made it longer, a longer wheelbase, um, stronger suspension, a few other things they changed to make it more stable in the desert terrain versus rally terrain. Yeah, the wheelbase definitely got longer. Yeah, they put a big section in the middle of the car, mm-hmm. probably for extra fuel tanks, and to make the car more stable when it's bouncing yeah. through the dunes. Um, of course, we almost forgot that in '85, that was the first year Mitsubishi showed up with three Pieros mm-hmm. and came in first and second. Mm-hmm. Kicking off a long tradition of Mitsubishi being awesome. Yep. And, uh, I mean, it makes sense that they could win this event because all through the 70s and early 80s, they dominated the safari rallies in, mm-hmm. in Colts mm-hmm. and the Australian desert rallies. So they had a lot of experience in the desert. And they sort of missed the boat on Group B, but were doing all these other type of smaller rallies. Yeah. And of course, these desert rallies. So, you know, that's. And then, uh, also interestingly, in '88, Ari Vatanen. This is the other interesting thing too, because Ari Vatanen was nearly killed in Argentina, right, in a Group B crash, and he never raced in Group B again. That would have been '87, though. 
Yep. Not 88. Yes, because he was. it took him nearly a year to recover. No, but I'm saying 87 was the first year he competed in Dakar, not 88. Yeah. So he came in, the Peugeots came in in 87. Yep. So the, so his group B was banned in 86. So we'll drop we'll drop back a year from the 10th anniversary event to 87. That's when Peugeot came in because, I mean, honestly, the um, Dakar rally is, if you had to assign a nationality to it, it would be French. It was started by a Frenchman. A lot of French competitors were in it. And Peugeot was heavily involved from the beginning, they were heavily involved with basically street cars. Yeah. And then they had the Group B car that was banned to race in Europe because it was too powerful, mm-hmm. too fast, not controllable enough. And they said, okay, we're going to use it in Dakar. And we're going to have Ari Vatten and drive it. Yeah. French have always been very pioneering in motorsports. Yes, and, I mean, the FIA is based out of Paris. So, um, yeah. And then... So, yeah, he was almost killed in 86... It took him a year to recover. Came back in 87 to Dakar. Because in... Group E was canceled. Correct. And then he ran Dakar. So that's pretty interesting to me, too. I didn't realize how how many times Ari Vatten had actually won the car. Yeah. Well, they were the first ones to come in and really... They put a full team effort, full factory backing. Right. Por- it... Porsche did it one year and won. Yeah. I, think, I think they won in 85. They came with a 959. Yeah. That was basically another Group B developed car. Yeah, cast off. Um. And they won it, and then they just stopped doing As it. As Jackie Ix. <laughs> yeah. They were like, all right, we're going to win, and we're done. I'm actually surprised. It was not Jackie Ix. It was um, no. Renee something. Okay. I'm Renee. actually surprised. Jackie Ix was the one that convinced Porsche to go. Yeah, maybe. It wasn't the driver, though. Renee something. What's I'll interesting, actually, I think it was because after the deaths in Group B, Audi kind of renounced racing for a while. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised that they never showed up to go to Takar. I don't know course they did much later on with volkswagen but well that was one of the things that people have talked about too was the um um eth- ethics of taking a car that was deemed too unsafe to race and taking it somewhere where there were no rules and be like yeah we're gonna race it here because who cares there's no rules yeah so the car is seen as unlimited where group e was outlawed outlawed <laughs> yeah. and so people question the you know it was a move there you know, it was not okay to have, you know, people killed in Europe, but yeah, yeah if some whatever. spectators get killed in Africa, it's like right. That's the that's the rub that they're saying. Yeah, I mean, obviously there was care taken to not injure spectators, but people are saying like, oh, you just don't care. So yeah. Anyway, um, but you know, the other interesting thing was in '88, uh, his Peugeot was stolen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they disqualified him. Yes. Because it was stolen. They eventually found it, but it was it was too late. I mean, his team car won anyway. Yeah. So, uh, Juha Kanuk, Kanuk, I can't pronounce those names. <laughs> Kunikin? Kunakin? Oh. Kanakin? Kunakin? Juha? Juha? Hana Mikulin or something? Oh, ho- yeah. Hana, Hana. No, not Hana Mikulin. I hear it and then. It's J U H A is his first name. It's like Hanu or something. Yeah, and the last name. I can, I can look it up, but I think it's K A N K U E N, Kan Kuen Kan Kuen. Yeah. Anyway, it was a team car to Ari Vatanen's Peugeot 205. These are the yellow camel sponsored because mm-hmm. it was the 80s. So it was still okay to have tobacco sponsorships. Mm-hmm. Um, ridiculous rear-engined yep. rally cars. So Ari Vatanen won four times. Yes. 1987, 89, through 91. And he was leading in 88 when his car was stolen. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he would have won that year probably too. Mm-hmm. But I guess what happened was he returned to service too late. Because they, they found his car. They discovered it. like Somebody somebody basically joy rode his car. Mm-hmm. They found it. But by the time they found it and got him back to service, he'd missed the check-in. So by the rules, he was disqualified. And they tried to fight to get him back in. And everybody was like, nope, rules are rules. Doesn't matter what happened. You didn't make it. So they disqualified Interestingly, him. he's had... Uh... In a single Dakar, Ari Vatanen won seven stages. That's most of them. Uh, and then this person, Pierre Letter- Lettergui. Sorry, really. Yeah, we're, we're horrible with these Really names. bad with the French <laughs> names. I have to hear them before I can pronounce them. But um, he won. Uh, he's won ten stages in a single Dakar. That's crazy. But Jackie Ix has won nine. 
what was he? And then, he was in 911 before they were the 959, right? Yeah. And then interestingly, Stefan Petterhansel, who is Mr. Dakar, has only won six in a single Dakar, six stages. Hmm. But if we go by um, most wins, so the most stage wins ever, Ari Vatanen at 50. Okay, that makes sense. And he's and again, this is because he came in at a time when other companies weren't putting the development money mm-hmm. into Dakar vehicles. Mm-hmm. So he was kind of like a it was you know gun to a knife fight kind of deal. Yeah. You know, it was him versus basically what amounted to some factory backing, but privateer teams. Mm-hmm. So there was no there was no real competition. And also he's Ari Vatten and he's an amazing driver on top of it. Yeah. So but that's when they that's when they say the whole Dakar changed from being this adventurous motorsport to this factory backed now it's about winning versus being about the adventure. Mm-hmm. So eighty nine they went to Libya. Uh Gaddafi provided free fuel yes. for the competitors. That's an interesting side note. Well, because uh, he wanted the tourist dollars, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, controversial. But uh, And then in 92, in an effort to combat lower entries, the race was changed from Paris to Cape Town. So basically traversing north-south the entire continent of Africa. Okay. And uh, then it went back to... That was the only year they went to Cape Town... Then they've gone back to... That was 91? 92. Oh, 92. So I actually have the pin is or over there somewhere. Because 91 was the year where one of the drivers was actually killed by military group, mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting too, mm-hmm. because he was they went into the wrong zone. They were off course, and they were basically fired upon by what they assumed to be um, like re- rebel uh, Torix. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's frightening. You don't, you don't consider going into a race that. I mean, you could die, sure, you could crash your vehicle, but you don't think you're gonna get shot. There's always been deaths at every Dakar, Pretty usually much. from accidents. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple motorcycle riders have been killed before they've even left France. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at most of the deaths, it's usually on motorcycles because they're unprotected. Uh, there was a very early truck death. Uh, it was a Dutch team. And the DAF. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, so then, you know, basically it's it went through the 90s uh, into the new millennium. And uh, at that time, you know, Africa is getting more and more dangerous and destabilized because yeah, colonialism has left. And there's one big group that really screwed everything up mm-hmm. for the entire world for a while. Uh so 2007 was the last year that Dakar was held in Africa. So it started in Lisbon, uh, and this was they did it through 2006, 2007, uh, and th- this is also the last Dakar that Mitsubishi won. Mm-hmm. They were heavily competing against Volkswagen in their Touaregs. Yeah, the blue Touaregs, Red, the Red Bull sponsored Touaregs. Mm-hmm. But the political climate and threat of terrorism in Africa uh, could no longer be ignored. Yeah, by well, the organizers. They basically they scheduled a wait event. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Al Qaeda was like, "We're going to kill all your competitors." Yep. So they were like, "Okay, event canceled." Yep. And now, for the last ten years, uh, Dakar has been run in South America. Yeah. So they skipped 08, obviously, because they couldn't mm-hmm. scramble fast enough to move the Which event. Which probably worked out good. I mean, there was a big economic downturn in 08, so well, yeah. I'm, <laughs> there's always been money for racing. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so many of the same obstacles have been found in South America. The terrain's not very, like, it's not that much different. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, a bit safer. Sometimes. As far as, yeah. yeah. There's still some destabilized areas down mm-hmm. there that aren't uh, the best. Nope. Uh, I mean, that's that's the challenge of running a, a rally that crosses multiple borders and countries. and it's, But that's kind of what makes up part of the adventure of it, I guess. And uh, so, and then, uh, you know... There's some parallels to European colonialism in the Dakar. So, you know, it's kind of like a bunch of Europeans descending on an underdeveloped part of the world to have an adventure and exploit the local natural resources, which is some of the criticisms yeah. that people have had of the Dakar. You know, even the Vatican called it like the most bloody race ever. Yeah, or the something. Vatican called for its 
stopping in like 2003 or something. Yeah. Uh, you know, and in the early days, Sabine did provide drinking water wells. Uh, he he was interested in giving back to Africa. He had a lot of respect for Africa. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe some of that got lost when he passed away. Yeah, no, he 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 installed yep. wa- wells in a lot of poor areas that yep. they rarely went through. And competitors bought supplies from the locals in the early days. Yeah, they didn't bring in any of their own food or anything, so they bought everything from the locals. And it, it supplied the local economy for a long time, but as the race progressed and got more involved and more and commercial, basically. More commercial, they started having secure areas for these vehicles. They would, you know, fly in so that tons of supplies. Didn't get yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there was like secure, you know, secured private bivouacs, which are camps that they stop in every night. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think they were talking about bivouacs on the Rebel Rally. Were not they saying they called them bivouacs? Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah, um, just a word I was unfamiliar with. Yeah, it's probably the French term for camp or something. Uh, and then locals were were killed in accidents, and uh, you know, it never seemed to be a super big deal. Kind of just like, eh. well, if you look at the way the locals were killed in accidents too, it was usually because they were somewhere they shouldn't have been. Yeah, or a few of them were they crashed their car into a competitor's car. Like it yeah. wasn't uh, like a kid was sitting in the middle of a road and he got run over. Like, yeah. eh, I mean, and some of the, the kids probably not used to cars coming at him at 100 miles an hour either. He's probably used to cars coming at him at 12. Yeah, but... some of the local governments weren't too nice to the the people. Yeah. Uh, well, they were saying that at the height of the working together with Dakar and the local people, that these people would make enough money in the week mm-hmm. to support them for the year. Mm-hmm. So that's why it was a big deal when they started bringing their own stuff because they yeah. weren't making the money anymore. So now they were there and they weren't contributing as much to the local economy. Yeah. So the good probably outweighs the bad, but you know, there's two sides to everything. So it was, it was interesting to see yeah, that other course. side of, of Dakar. Um if we go by, so the most wins ever for a cars driver, so Stefan Petter Hansel, so he started in motorcycles, mm-hmm. moved to cars in 2004. Uh, he has the most wins of seven to cars. Mostly in his cars, he was in Pajeros. For a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, but now he moved to Peugeot, and then he was running Mini this year. Yeah, you know, I mean, until the Pajero yep. stopped running in 07. Yep. I mean, from 84 to 07, the Pajero won 12 times overall, which is... 85 to 07, yep, 12 yeah. times. Crazy. seven, And then seven consecutive times. Yeah, it's crazy. So, yeah, so the next so the next highest driver is Ari Vatanen with four wins, and then Nasser Arletia with three wins. And uh, then you get down to... Um, you yeah, know, the most, most so, motorcycle was Cyril Naveau, the first winner. He won like five times. Yeah. So interesting. So wins by manufacturer, Mitsubishi has 12. So 85, 92, 93, 97, 98, 2000 through 2007. It's crazy. Um, and it's they, amazing they couldn't like sell more trucks with that. They did it outside <laughs> yeah. of the U.S., uh, and then the next runner-up is Peugeot with seven wins. Okay, and again, and now Peugeot doesn't run factory teams anymore. Um, Mitsubishi didn't for a long time either until this year. Sebastian Loeb was running um, a privateer of the Peugeot. They pulled out, hmm. and now Mini is the the big guns. Yeah, they were beat the past three years though, because mm-hmm. Toyota won this year and Peugeot won the past two yep. years. And the most stage wins by a manufacturer, 150, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi. Yeah. Peugeot, 78. That's almost half. That's crazy. So a lot of some of this information came from the BBC documentary on Dakar. Yeah, highly recommended. But it's interesting, though, because Mitsubishi did win so, so much. And they, they never talk about they it. They barely talked about it. You know, actually, they never even mentioned it. The only time you see them is when you see them in the background. And they had like a big issue in the 2000s when they were fighting with Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. It was quite a competition. It was interesting. Um, One thing I did take out from that documentary that I learned is that they did a Gen 1 um, Pajero, so like my Raider, Mm -hmm. in a Rothmans livery. And that makes me happy because that's really cool. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't know that existed. (laughs) So to sum up Dakar, I'll end with this quote from Sabine. 
and this kind of this sums up like a lot of stuff, right? Uh, it's uh, you know Dakar, a challenge for those who go, a dream for those who stay behind. Makes sense, right? Yeah, of course. Because like, we it's want the same we, for anything, right? Everything's a challenge if right? you do it, and you don't ever do it. They just think about right? it. Right? Doesn't that you work? Regret not doing it. I love that quote. It works yeah, for so one. many things. You know, like a, even just a regular rally, mm-hmm. like just a, a, you know, American Rally Association rally, yeah, is a challenge for those who go and a dream for those who stay behind, right? So you know, do stuff. Go go out there. Go chase it. You know, we're trying. It's um, not easy. It costs no, money. It does. <laughs> I can't get to the car, so. <laughs> I know. It'd be amazing, though. Let's go to Dakar in a cult. <laughs> Actually, we should do it in an old Pajero. Yeah. And just for, you know, just for shits and giggles. Hmm. Anyway. All right. Anything else? I don't think so, Andrew. It was a quick little uh, 40 minutes on Dakar. I like it. I hope you learned some facts. We hadn't done an actual topic in a while. But uh, as always, you can find us on Facebook, Auto Off Topic Podcast, on Instagram, Auto Off Topic. You can find me on Instagram, at Race and Anger, and uh, TSI 350. TSI 350. No, even I screwed it up. TSISS 350 is my name on Instagram. All right. Sounds good. So, a challenge for those who go, a dream for those who stay behind. As always, keep your cars analog. And aim for the roses. You can't add a third quote to that. I won't. It's just special (laughs) for this one.